And the United States right now is going through a, a rather remarkable time. Government spending in the United States at the federal level is at an all-time high outside of war at about tw almost 25 percent, up from a level of about 18 to 19 percent of GDP. So from 18 to 19 to about tw almost 25. What is it in Israel? What percentage of, gov of, of GDP is government spending in Israel, roughly? Okay, I tried to find it before I got here. I think it's, I, I saw 45 to 50, okay? Wait, so in, on, on paper, it looks like Israeli government's about twice the size of America, which is consistent with, I think, what people think of as uh, Israel being a somewhat socialist country, has a socialist heritage, and America is a free enterprise system. But of course, when you include state and local, I see Sam shaking his head before when you include state and local, actually government spending in the United States is just about 40%. So it's not so different. Um, the regulatory environment, of course, is, is another part of it. But I just today I'm going to mainly talk about spending. Now, people who favor larger government, and of course, in America today, despite the increase in the size of government over the last three or four years, there are people who wish it were larger still. They are very clear about what you get when government gets bigger. What do you get? You get more education, more health care, more housing, more aid to the poor. Who is against those things? Nobody. Everybody wants more housing, more education, more health care, more aid to the poor. Everybody thinks those are good things. Now, we can debate whether when government spends more on education, you get more education. You certainly get more spending on education. That's undeniable, right? But whether you actually get more, but, but the goal of it is very clear. The people who want bigger government want more housing, more health, more education. People like me who want smaller government, what do I want? What do you get when government gets smaller? What do you get more of? Now, in the United States, the dif by the way, I was, at, I was in the at the hotel uh, yesterday afternoon, and I'm chatting with some tourists, and one of them said, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm giving a talk on what happens when government gets smaller, and he said, uh, well, what do you think? And I said, I wish government were a lot smaller, and I started to say the next sentence, and he said, oh, I get it, you're a Republican. <laughs> and I said, no, I hate the Republicans, actually, and, and I hate the Democrats. Not a Republican. I said they both, and I, I said it's true. Republicans talk about smaller government, but they still actually government gets bigger under Republicans and Democrats. They both like to spend money on their friends. They just have different friends. Okay, that's my, in a nutshell, that's my view uh, of the political process. So when I, if you ask in America. What happens when government gets smaller? What's good about it? Most politicians will say it's very simple. You get more of your own money to keep and spend. So the main virtue of smaller government, the way it's phrased in America, is lower taxes. Now, of course, it turns out that often government spending continues to increase while tax rates fall. Tax rates fall, which means I follow the Milton principle, Milton Friedman principle, which is if you want to know how big your tax rate is, look at the size of government relative to GDP, not how it's financed, right? Because if we borrow to finance it, we're simply going to be taxing later rather than today. But put that to the side. In general, the argument is made in America. The virtue of smaller government is that you'll have more money. Now, think about that argument. Which side of that argument do you want to be on? The side that says, I'm in favor of helping the poor, more education, and more health care. That's the bigger government side. Or my side, the smaller government side. I want to keep more of my money. Now, that is an unpleasant moral position to defend. The average person, and the average person would like more money. We all understand that. But the average person doesn't exactly like to brag about it and doesn't like to express it in the voting booth necessarily or talk to his or her friends about how they feel. They don't want to say, yeah, I voted for the small government guy because I, I want to have more money. That's unappealing, 
It is not an emotionally appealing argument. Uh, come on over here, folks. There's a chair here, and there's, there's three chairs here. So my claim is that the big government crowd has the moral high ground. Uh, they get the folk songs and the poetry, uh, right? Because who wants to write a folk song about, I want to be rich? Now, <clears throat> there is, somebody pointed out that the, the Beatles song, Tax Man, has a little bit of that flavor. But in general, the other side speaks to the heart, and my side speaks to the pocketbook. That's a lousy choice. I don't want to speak to the pocketbook. I want to speak to the heart. So I'm going to argue today that the small government arguments are the marketing is bad. Marketing small government as low taxes is bad. And it also misses what I think is the most important part of the argument. Certainly, people want to be inspired by something bigger than themselves. Lower taxes is not a form of tikkun olam. It just, it's not. Now, when the stimulus package was proposed in the United States, we spent, um, it was supposed to be 700 something billion. It's ended up being about $820 billion. The President of the United States asked local jurisdictions, states and cities, to make a list of crucial projects. They were often called shovel ready, which means ready to just get into work. Now, it turns out that's not what we ended up spending the money on. About a third of the money went toward tax rebates that had little or no effect. A third of the money went to state governments to spend to keep teachers and firefighters employed. And a third of the money maybe went to things that you might start to call shovel ready, but most of them weren't shovel really projects. They were a lot of it went, for example, to universities who are politically powerful, and they got money to say for more health research, which is a nice thing, but it doesn't put a lot of unemployed construction workers in Nevada back to work. Okay, so the projects didn't work very well. But at the beginning, there you had to make a list. So I saw Minnesota, northern part of the United States. I, Duluth, Minnesota, is a very cold, unpleasant place, and I saw a news clip from Duluth, Minnesota, where they were talking about some of the projects that Duluth was going to do with, if they could get some government money. $750,000 for a skating park. A, a golf course clubhouse for one and a half million dollars. But my favorite, six million dollars to make snow so people could do more skiing in Duluth which is good because you always want to be outside in Duluth when it's 10 degrees below zero. So they were interviewing people. What do you think of these projects? What do you think of these projects? And they, they found a woman who said, oh, those sound horrible. Those are terrible projects. That's a waste of money. And she said, that money should be spent. And they said, well, what should it be spent on? And she said, education. And I think most people would agree with her. It would be better to spend the money on education than snowmaking equipment. But not me. Well, I'm against spending money on education. What's wrong with me? I look like a horrible person. Don't I care about the children? What kind of ogre wants less education? Do I hate children? But I'm not against education. What I'm against is more government spending on education. There is a great deal of evidence that more government spending on education, which we've been doing on a per capita basis, corrected for inflation, and that it has been bad for education in America. It has not helped the children. It has helped the friends of government. So when President Bush reformed, reformed education, he had a law called No Child Left Behind, and he improved the curriculum. What curriculum was adopted? A curriculum put forward by a company started by one of his officials, a crony, a special interest. But it was all for the children. Did the curriculum work very well? Not particularly, but it made somebody very, very rich. There's a lot of evidence that the increased role of the federal government in education has been bad for the children, especially in America's inner cities, the poorer children. I'm the bad guy. 
Why am I the bad guy? But I am the bad guy, right? I'm the guy who wants less money for education. So if the choice is more money for the children, more money for the rich because they have lower taxes, this wins every time, right? This wins. But that's not the choice. The choice is between having the current system in America, and I'm sure it's worse here, and the current system in America, elected officials on something called a school board, and union teachers spend other people's money on people they don't particularly care about, the children, instead of a world where the parents and the administrators would work together because the administrators would have to keep the parents happy. In America, schools have monopoly power locally if you want the free subsidized school. Does it work very well? It only works well in parts of America where the parents have choices. Where the parents have choices to go to a private school, the public schools work well. But if we got away from government schools, would we have a world of no education? Would we have a world where education was all driven by profit? And the answer is no. The people who want bigger government will tell us that the alternative to government is profit. The alternative to government is individualism. The alternative to government is selfishness. But none of these things are true. The alternative to government is competition. The alternative to government is voluntary cooperation. And the alternative to government is accountability every day, not just election day, when there are only a few choices. Now, part of the reason that government spending is such an attractive way to finance the things that we like is that we have a romance about government that we are doing it together. It's something we do collectively. This is not true. It's a form of romance or self-deception. President Obama recently put it this way, in our democracy, government is us. And that is the view that people believe and are often told is what democracy is. Government is us. Who's us? Who are we? When government does things here in Israel, is there unanimity about the outcome? Does everybody agree? We all got together in a big group. We sang folk songs, we played the guitar, and we came to an agreement to help the poor or whatever, to help when Sam talked about uh, government housing policy. I like to say, as a, as a social policy, he conceded, I think it was a, a nice thing to say, which we all agree, that it's good for the poor to own houses relative to not owning houses. But I like to say, you know, they say in America, it's the American dream that everyone own a house. And I would say that's not the American dream, that's the dream of the National Association of Realtors and the National Association of Home Builders. Those are the people who also want to benefit from the process. So when we do something through government, which we use that word all the time, we think in our minds government is us, there's a group of people often who get a lot of the benefit, and there's another group of people sometimes who absolutely don't even think it's a good goal, and yet they are forced to pay for it. So when the government bailed out AIG, which was really a bailout of Goldman Sachs, because they owed him $9 billion, which is actually real money for Goldman Sachs. When the government bailed out General Motors, I thought it was a horrible idea. That wasn't government is us. Keep, that's not me. That was not speaking for me. I thought that was those were bad ideas. Government doesn't actually have us doing stuff together. So I want to suggest, and how many people here are studying economics? Raise your hand. Okay, so to me, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk is the deepest thing that economics understands. And it sometimes goes by the name of the invisible hand, and it sometimes goes by the name of emergent order, and it sometimes goes by the name of spontaneous order, and it's, but I like to call it emergent order harmony. It's stuff that we do together, sometimes implicitly, and it's the ways, the thousands of ways that we cooperate 
as people in commerce, but not just commerce. So in the talk, my title has the subtitle of civil, talking about civil society and what makes life deep and real and kind and pleasant are the people we associate with. Life is not, in anybody's book, certainly not Adam Smith's, the quintessential economist, and certainly not any good economist book, life is not about homo economicus, this maximizing individual. All of our lives are about working with others. We do that in so many different ways. We do it in our work. We do it in our play. We do it in all dimensions of our life. So to think about economics as this is place where I'm on my own looking out for myself, that can be a useful way to think about individual decision making, but it's not what we do. What we do is we cooperate and interact with others. Adam Smith in the marketplace called it our incentive to truck, barter, and exchange, right? Our propensity to truck, barter, and exchange, meaning to interact with each other in the economic sphere. But it's so much deeper than that. So when I talk about emergent order and the ways that we interact and cooperate, it's a subtle, subtle concept. I've been thinking about it for about 10 years, and I just am starting to think I might understand it. Most economists think, oh yeah, market forces, I understand that. But that's not all it is, okay? So I'm gonna try to give you some of the flavor of that. We don't, and by the way, I'm under a terrible handicap. I know all of you speak English, and all of you speak English much better than I speak Hebrew, okay? <laughs> But unfortunately, English, which is a very rich language, struggles to describe what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to try to give you different ways to see it and think about it. And I apologize that I can't use Hebrew to give you the flavor because it is something of a language issue. So I would suggest that we need words, which we do not have, to describe what it means for us to do something. For example, not through government, which is not us, but the way we do many things in the world. So for example, uh, if the government does not manufacture pencils, we all understand that we still have plenty of pencils. We don't need the government to manufacture pencils. But how about when a few hundred million Chinese go from the countryside to the city and they start sending their kids to school for the first time and the worldwide demand for pencils goes way up. There should be a crisis. You should go to the store to buy a pencil here in Israel or in the United States or in Sweden and you say, I'll have a dozen pencils and they should say, pencils? We had to send them all to China, we're out. Come back in six months, but it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen even though there's nobody in charge of the pencil market. There's nobody from the top down trying to figure out how to cope with this new Chinese demand. How is it that there are pencils left for us? Who made the decision? Think about how complicated that world is. When the Chinese want more pencils, the people who already are pencil demanders could decide to get by with fewer. Or we could have people who make pencils make more. Or we could say to the Chinese, I know you wanted two billion, but you could only have one and a half. Those are three simple choices. They're actually quite complicated because when I decide to go without pencils, I have to decide, am I gonna use a pen? Am I gonna use the pencil longer? Am I gonna use a different kind of lead? I have all kinds of decisions to make and we all are making these decisions at the same time. And somehow what actually happens is a mix of all three. The Chinese get by with a little bit less, pencil makers make a little bit more, and those of us who already use pencils decide to get by with a little bit less. But how that works and how that's coordinated and how we, through our actions, create that harmony it is a miraculous thing. Hayek called it a marvel that we do not appreciate. But there's harmony in the world, that that doesn't lead to a fight or a crisis without anyone having to worry about it is an amazing thing. So who is in charge? Who does decide? And the answer is we do, 
through all of our individual actions, we decide, just like we decide how to make a pencil. I can't make a pencil. Milton Friedman famously talked about using the example of Leonard Reed's, that no one can make a pencil. Pencil, this very simple creation, requires the coordination and cooperation of thousands and thousands of people. Who coordinates it? Nobody. We do, but that language, we do, makes it sound like we get in a big room and we have a vote, or we argue it out and come to a consensus, but that's not how we do that. We do that through what's called a market. And we are led, as if by an invisible hand, to create a world of harmony and a world where we cooperate in the face of dynamic change. But it's not just the pencil market that works that way. And I want you to try to think about the ways in our world and in our life where these forces work. And by these forces, I mean, how do our individual decisions coalesce, come together to create the world around us, which is surprisingly harmonious? How does that get created outside of the traditional things we think of? We think of pencils. Oh yeah, the pencil market, that works fine. What about other markets? What about other areas of our life where there is interaction of this kind? Do, do those forces work there? And so for example, in the United States, government is very uninvolved in religion, except for one thing. The government subsidizes through tax deductions, contributions to religion, which is some, has some effect. But other than that, it makes, has, no, has no decisions whatsoever. It doesn't tell you when to build a new church, a new synagogue, a new mosque. It doesn't tell you what it's going to look like. There's no official state religion. And as it turns out, the United States has the most vibrant religious marketplace in the world. There is lots of choice. It's incredibly dynamic. It is incredibly fluid. But if the government isn't involved in religion, it's not up to me to build my own synagogue. We build religious institutions together. I join voluntarily with people who share my views and we build things together and not just the building. I mean, the building is nice, that's an incredible achievement. But the community, that's what counts. We build that community. We decide, not through consensus, not through a vote, not through majority rule, but in my community, if you have a baby, you get free food for two weeks, right? That's our community, I don't know what it's like in your communities, but in my community where I, where I live, if you have a baby, you get food for two weeks. It's not a law, it's not written down anywhere. That custom emerged and was decided by us, but not in the way we usually think of the word decide. It happened through culture and norms and behavior. By the way, I think one of the reasons that the effect that, that Sam talked about, that somebody asked the question of her, why did it take 40 years? I would suggest part of the reason is that it's a little bit embarrassing if you're a banker to go to a casino. But after a while, it's not so embarrassing. If everybody goes to the casino and it becomes sort of acceptable and the casino was mortgage-backed securities, then it's okay. But, if, but they didn't invest in gold stocks, right? They didn't invest in Australian gold mines. That would be a little too embarrassing. But if you look at banker's culture, banker's culture evolves. It's not, it's not under anyone's control. It's affected by laws and regulation. I would suggest that when Wall Street became more publicly traded and less of a partnership, the culture changed in very particular ways. But that culture on Wall Street, just like the culture in my religious community about what happens when you have a baby, that's not written down by anybody. It comes up from the bottom up. It emerges, and it is under no one's control. But we decide it. Again, we don't have a language for that, really. That phrase, we decide, doesn't describe in English what happens about when you have a baby.
because it isn't a decision. We didn't sit around as a, as a, as a shoal and say, well, what should be a good length of time for people to get food after? I mean, it's hard when you have a baby. We didn't do that. It somehow just happened. Notice that we never have to reform the pencil market. Never a crisis. Ah, oh, we got to do something about those number three pencils. They're just not sharp enough, right? It doesn't happen. We don't have any crises in pencils. It doesn't happen. And we don't have any crisis in America about religion. You have it here, big time, right? Because you have government. What's the right word? Government and religion are intertwined in, I think, very unhealthy ways. But I said I wasn't going to give any advice, sorry. <clears throat> But it's clear that it leads to a different situation. It leads to a very different situation. In America, what are the two things that we always are reforming? <clears throat> Healthcare and education, constantly. Oh, we gotta fix it. They, they need reforming because they're very badly run. And they're very badly run because the government is deeply involved in them. In non-government cooperation, in private cooperation, which is my community's decision about how many days you get free food if you get pregnant and you have a baby. In non-government organizations such as the pencil market, in non-government organizations such as what are the dues for my synagogue and who gets a price break and how do we decide who pays full price and who gets honored and who doesn't get much attention and who's politically powerful. All those decisions are constantly under pressure from competition from other organizations. But in healthcare and education, the competition is much less. In the private cooperation, the pencils, the synagogue, everything else, there's constant reform. People are constantly using information that they have and innovation and trying new things. And if they don't work, they get pushed aside. If they do work, they get embraced. It doesn't work in, in education in the United States. No incentive for it to work. Doesn't work for health care. No incentive for it to work. The real distinction that matters is not between collective action versus individualism, which is the way it's described. Over here, we're helping the poor. We're helping education. We're helping health care. Over here, I'm helping myself. I'm getting keep more of my income. That's not the right distinction. The right distinction is between top-down collectivism, decisions made from the top, versus decisions made from the bottom by all of us in that way I can't, I don't have a set of good words to describe. It's between communal choice out of Washington in America or communal choice that comes from all of us. This kind is shaped by our skills, our dreams, and desires using knowledge that we have about the situation at hand. There is nothing inherently selfish or individualistic about having more freedom. In a world of freedom, you can choose to live in the woods by yourself, right? Or you can choose to live in a big crowded city and join a bunch of clubs and have a bunch of hobbies that you share with other people and work for a charity that you care about. Those are all part of smaller government. Smaller government is not about keeping more of your money. It's part of it, but it's not the most important part. The most important part of smaller government is letting us make our choices about who we cooperate with. Now, it'd be nice to have a name for this what I call bottom-up collectivism. And the best word I can think of is socialism. But that's already taken, so that's not a good word. <clears throat> but think about it. What is socialism? Socialism is what we do with our lives, right? It's why you're here right now, right? We're socializing. We are doing stuff together. I'm talking. You're listening. I hope you have a chance to talk in a minute. But that's what we do. That's what this organization's about the Jerusalem Institute for Market Studies. It's a bunch of people who got together who care about a particular cause. It has nothing to do with profit. It has nothing to do with selfishness. It has to do with cooperation. It's about socializing 
It's about doing stuff together in a way that's different than this way over here, which is a bunch of elected officials who have accountability every election and, and who keep out the competitors most of the time. That's a different thing, but we don't have a phrase for it. To describe how my actions combine with yours to create something that we don't intend or design or plan. Adam Smith called it the invisible hand. Hayek called it spontaneous order. And as I said before, I think of it as emergent harmony. History of economic thought footnote. Adam Smith really didn't call it the invisible hand. When he used the invisible hand as a formal phrase, he meant something very specific. But he talked all the time about this kind of cooperation that we're talking about. He just didn't use the phrase invisible hand. And we've come to use that phrase. And I want to close with his example. Now, how many people here have ever read Adam Smith? Raise your hand. You probably read which book? The Wealth of Nations, which is the most famous book. The Theory of Moral Sentiments is his other book, which is his greatest book, in my opinion. I mean, I'm glad he wrote The Wealth of Nations. It was important. I don't deny it. But it's really hard to read, right? You read the first 30 or 40 pages. The first 30 pages are fantastic. Division of Labor, that stuff is immortal. I encourage you to read it. After that, he gets into some stuff, some weird stuff we don't really relate to anymore. It's it's, it, the language is not so good. It's hard to figure it out. But the Theory of Moral Sentiments he wrote in 1759. He revised it in 1790 or 91. And in between, he wrote The Wealth of Nations, 1776. He revised The Theory of Moral Sentiments six times. He loved that book. It makes me sad that it's forgotten. It's a great book. When you start it, you're going to struggle with it a little bit also. Keep going. Just keep, keep reading. It gets better. He talks about the iPad. He does. He says, gadgets will not make you happy. It's full of interesting advice, shockingly, about how money will not make you happy, that the pursuit of wealth is a bad idea. It's full of interesting advice. But he says something in there. He says many profound things. But one thing he says in there that's extremely profound, and he talks about the source of morality, and he talks about feedback loops. Okay? How do you say feedback loops in Hebrew? Can somebody help me here? Feedback? Feedback? Okay. What? Izun? Izun de Chazer? Good. Okay. So we know what that is, right? So in economics, in economics, feedback loops are if everybody wants pencils, the price starts to rise, and that starts to discourage some of the people who were already buying pencils to allow the new demanders to get some of that uh, freed up supply. That's a feedback loop in economics. But what, what Smith was interested in besides that was feedback loops in morality. And listen what he says. The all wise, meaning very wise, author of nature. So he's going to talk about the author of nature, which is God. He says, the all wise author of nature has taught man to respect the sentiments and judgments of his brethren. That is, he's made us sensitive to what other people think of us. The most, one of the most profound lines in the book is he says, man wants to be loved and to be lovely. We want the affection of others and we want to earn that affection. We don't want to fool people into thinking we're good people. We actually want to be good. Then he talks about self-deception, about how we often think we're good when we're not. And he says this unbelievable thing, he says, he says, bold is the surgeon whose hand does not shake when he operates on himself. Meaning, when you look into your own soul, you kind of, to fix it, you can't really bear to do it. It's too hard. It's too painful. He says, if we saw ourselves as others see, it, see us, we couldn't live for an instant. It would be unbearable. We'd have to change, which is a very sobering thought. So what he's saying here, though, is that I care about what other people think of me, right? I care about their judgments and their sentiments. He says, he taught man, God taught man to be more or less pleased 
when they approve of his conduct and to be more or less hurt when they disapprove of it. So when someone, if you come up to me after and say, great talk, I, get, I have to admit it, I feel kind of good. Right? I'd like to think, oh, I, don't really, I don't really care. Of course I do. I want you to think it's a good talk. And if you come and say, well, that was confusing. I hated that talk. I, that's, I disagree. I feel a little bit worse, right? Or worse, I do a bad job. And Rob says, gosh, that was terrible. I'm really going to be upset. So there's a feedback loop there that's going to affect my behavior. And this is, this is the more profound part. God, he said, he has made man, if I may say so, Smith being a little bit reluctant to look into God's briefcase. He has made man, if I may say so, the immediate judge of mankind and has in this respect, as in many others, created him after his own image. He has made man the immediate judge of mankind. Immediate meaning on the spot, on the ground, right? What an incredible statement that is, that God, in Smith's words, has made us responsible for each other's behavior by our judgment. So if you do something, if we're at the grocery together, and you get undercharged, and I notice, and you keep the money, I make a judgment on you. I may say something, I may just raise my eyebrow, or I may not want to be your friend anymore because I think you're not a nice person. Smith goes on to say, unbelievable, by acting morally, Smith says, we promote we necessarily pursue the most effectual means for promoting the happiness of mankind. He's saying that we, by our judging of each other, create a pleasant place to live, a civil society. And may therefore be said in some sense to cooperate with the deity and to advance as far as in our power the plan of providence. So what Smith is saying is that by our associations, and our disassociations with other people, and our judgments, and our sentiments, and our applause, and our disapproval, we create the world we live in, and it's a good world, and it can be a good world, because it's not always a good world. He's saying morality is built into us by God, and that by approving of what others do when they do good, and disapproving of what they do when they do evil, those feedback loops create a civil society without human oversight from the top down. There is human oversight, but it's not from the top down. It's on the ground, each of us interacting and influencing each other. So when we smile at someone or honor someone who does a kindness, when we raise an eyebrow at rude behavior, when we're not nice to people who are cruel or dishonest, we are partnering, partnering with God to create something called a civil society, a moral system that we don't intend. None of us is thinking, you know, hey, if I do the right thing, that's going to create a better world. No, we don't. Maybe in the back of our minds sometimes. Our morality, like the market for pencils, is under no individual human being's control. We create it in that funny way that we create the market for pencils. We decide that being polite is good or being impolite is good. It's up to us. So we decide that, but not in the way we decide most things. Not a majority rule election, not a referendum. They emerge, these norms, these morals, through the myriad of interactions between millions of people in the same way that we decide who gets the pencils. In a Jewish context, in a world where God has hidden his face, it means that repairing the world is in our hands. It's up to us. It's an incredible thing. Give us a smaller government, and we will create a civil society based on information and dreams and compassion from the bottom up. We're social animals. We're not selfish. We're self-interested, but we're not selfish. Get government out of the way, and we will not be out for ourselves. We like to trade with each other. We also like to talk with each other. And we like to buy from each other. And we like to sing with each other. And we like to build things together. 
The real choice we face is between coercive collectivism, forced action, versus voluntary action. This one is not so effective, and it serves the friends of those who hold power. This second one, bottom-up cooperation, is effective because it uses information. Losers get weeded out by competition. Bad ideas, bad morals get weeded out and power is less concentrated. Smaller government is good not because it will make us rich, but because it will set us free. When we are free, we will not only be more prosperous, though we will be, but we will work with our neighbors and friends in the myriads of ways that are possible when we can choose what we want and who we want to work with. Some of those ways are commercial, some are recreational, some are spiritual, but all the ways we choose will be shaped by our dreams, our skills, and our desires. What do we get when government gets smaller? We get more life. Thank you very much.